Our next sponsor is Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters with great sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. Podcorn takes out the middleman so podcasters of all levels have a chance to monetize their podcasts, setting their own rates and having full control over their collaborations. We started using Podcorn a few months ago and it's already changed the game. We can actually make some money from podcasting, which means we can put more time into doing what we love and trying to produce quality content. I found the site so easy to use, podcorn.com. You'll find the link in our show notes. It really is easy to navigate and you can view loads of different sponsorship opportunities right there on your screen. It couldn't be easier to pitch a proposal to a brand to work with them on a campaign. Podcorn makes sure podcasters are able to keep their creative freedom and have full control over how and when we monetize. They also have automated payment, which means you get your money as soon as you've submitted your work. If you're a fellow podcast host, definitely check out their site, podcorn.com. Welcome to Crime Lapse. I'm Eileen. And I'm Charlie. We'd like to start by thanking the family of Fiona Sinnott, especially Gina for speaking with us and sharing their story. When someone goes missing, they often show up not long after. But sometimes, when someone disappears, a disappointing truth would be so much easier than never knowing at all. While the death of a loved one is an indescribable feeling, the finality and closure is a bittersweet comfort that those whose relatives are still missing long for. When someone you love goes missing, it is a continual feeling of loss. There are no definitive answers. All you can do is hold on to hope. Broadway is a small village in County Wexford, located in the southeast of Ireland. The hilltop area is just over 10 miles from Wexford town. Located on the rural fringe of Ladies Island Lake, the village contains just one primary school and a pub, Butler's. In February 1998, Fiona Sinnott was out at Butler's pub with friends. When she walked out of the pub just after midnight, she promised she would see them the next weekend but she was never seen again. This is the Wall of Silence. Pat Sinnott was a fisherman from Kilmore Quay, a fishing and tourist trap in County Wexford. His brother John was engaged to a woman named Margaret. Pat met Margaret's sister Mary and fell in love. Both couples decided to start their lives together in Wexford, settling in Kilmore. Pat and Mary Sinnott had four children by 1978. Two boys, Norman and Seamus, and two girls, Diane and Caroline. The Sinnots welcomed their fifth child on September 9th, 1978. They named the little girl Fiona. The youngest of the Sinnott children, she was well protected and adored by her older siblings and extended family. Fiona attended the local primary school, Kilmore National School, until 1992 when she went on to secondary school. From a young age, Fiona's personality shone through. She was headstrong and independent. When she left school at 15, she wanted to support herself and have the best in life. Growing up, uh, she went to Kilmore National School and her friends would have seen her as being considerate, reliable. Um, give her for pranks. She loves to make people laugh. Um, she really loved her family and friends and loved mo- nothing more than socialising with the friends as well. Nothing fazed her. Um, she loved being around people and she was very rarely contrary. She was very, I suppose, very mature for her age. Um, she was the youngest child, as I said, and wanted to be independent from an early age. According to Gina, Fiona's cousin and close friend growing up, Fiona never liked school. When they attended Bridgetown Vocational College together for secondary school, Gina remembers Fiona only enjoying seeing her friends and leaving the school gates at the end of the day. The pair were incredibly close and would go back to Fiona's family home at lunchtime just 400 metres from the school and listen to music and smoke cigarettes before drenching themselves in Fiona's older sister Caroline's perfume to disguise the smoke smell on their uniform. Gina recalls Fiona being a kind and friendly young woman, always tried to keep everyone around her feeling involved and loved, 
If there was ever a student on the peripheral of a conversation or a group at school that Fiona was a part of, she would make it her mission to involve that person. Happy to help anyone with anything, she wanted a lot for herself. She had goals and they revolved around Fiona's urge to provide for herself, especially buying herself some more expensive items. She wanted to work to afford these things for herself. She was independent. As a result of these desires, Fiona left school at 15 to work. She had a zest for life and her determination was paying off. Just a few months later, Fiona got her first boyfriend, a man 11 years her senior. Fiona was besotted. She described him as being a real man. He had a motorbike and she loved him. Growing up, Fiona loved the idea of love and she she loved fast and hard. And I remember she was 15 and a half, I think, when she had her first boyfriend. In fact, her, her only ever boyfriend. And we were sitting up in her bedroom and she was scrawling her name on the back of her homework journal. She had left school at the time and the person she was in a relationship with, like she had written her own name and then the surname of the person that she was with and telling me like what she wanted to do with her life and have a family. And I couldn't really understand it because I was only 15 and, a half, 15 and a half myself. Well, I was 15 Um it was five months between myself and Fiona. So we were like quite close in age. Her partner was a lot older than her and I think she loved the fact that she could go off and explore different places with him because he was a a biker and she could see different parts of the country where it was outside of Wexford. It was a bit of a shock to the family when they found out at uh, 17 she wanted to move out and uh, be more independent and get a job. Less than two years later, a then 17-year-old Fiona was adamant that she wanted to move in with her boyfriend. The two moved in together to Georgia Street in Wexford, a historic street near to the town centre. Once the move happened, Fiona's family quickly noticed the zest for life Fiona previously held was beginning to dwindle. Despite her best efforts to hide the truth, Gina could see in her eyes that things were not good at home. Fiona began to retreat from her family and friends, she no longer attended family events. When Fiona missed Gina's 18th birthday, Gina was worried. When she did move out, she moved into Georgia Street in County Wexford. She had a one-bedroom flat and she was doing really well. She was um, on a course and she really loved that because uh, she got to see people on a daily basis. It was at 17 that the family kind of saw a shift in her attitude and um, the way she was, I suppose, she didn't look like the Fiona we knew. She was a lot more withdrawn and um, not as happy as, as she would have previously been. So she was questioned on that and at first she, she was saying everything was fine Um but it, w- it didn't take long before the family noticed the physical changes in her, like with the odd scratch here and there and a bruise that she couldn't explain. Um, and that was quite hard because she, I suppose she felt that she couldn't come out and say it, but it did take her a while. Not long after this, Fiona sat down with Gina and confided in her. She had been experiencing abuse at the hands of her boyfriend, physical and mental abuse leading to gaslighting behaviours as the horrific actions of Fiona's boyfriend were deflected back onto her. He made Fiona feel like there was something wrong with her, that she was going crazy. Fiona wasn't allowed friends and family over, and she didn't feel like she was even allowed to go out. A row would break out at home if Fiona even went for a cup of tea with her family. Every aspect of Fiona's life was controlled by the man she loved, and she was terrified of him. Gina said... I did try to tell her that this behaviour wasn't what a loving relationship should be. But she thought eventually she could love the violence out of him. One of the uh, big hospital visits, I suppose, where she was admitted with um, bite marks to her face and her leg. And the family were notified about that. But Fiona had said that she was threatened by 
the person that inflicted these um, injuries that he would hurt her had she said it was him. So he forced her to blame someone else. And the nurses in the hospital had stated that they knew Fiona by first name because she had been admitted into hospital so many times and they knew what was what was going on. Um, one nurse even suggested that she make a statement against her abuser, but Fiona didn't want to because I suppose she didn't want to get him in trouble. And the fact that she had also said that he would change, and I think she really believed in her own head that uh, he would change. The family pleaded with Fiona to leave her abuser and I don't think um, it really sunk in with her for a very long time that she needed to walk away. She wasn't strong enough to do it. When Fiona was 18, a year after the pair moved in together, she found out she was pregnant. She was absolutely overjoyed. The father of the baby, however, was not. Fiona was physically punished as a result of her pregnancy. Her partner claimed that she had fallen pregnant intentionally to trap him. Fiona maintained her positive mindset that things would change. She was sure that having a baby would calm him down and they could live the happy life she so longed for. In the summer of 1996, Fiona got pregnant. While she was living in Georgia Street, she was really happy. She always wanted to be a mom. She was really good with other people's children. She wanted the best for her little baby, and uh, her daughter was born then, February 1997. On the 28th of February 1997, Fiona gave birth to a beautiful little girl. She was a natural and caring mother, but the situation surrounding her was not the newborn happy family bubble you expect when you're post-birth. Her partner's mother had never warmed to Fiona, She always assumed it was the old mindset that no one is ever good enough for a mother's only son. But even after she brought her a grandchild, Fiona wasn't allowed past the threshold of his mother's front door. It wasn't long after Fiona returned home from the hospital after having her daughter that the abuse resumed. But something had changed now. Fiona was a mother. Her motherly instincts kicked in. She hadn't been able to protect herself over the years, but now she would do anything to protect her daughter. She told the father of her child that she was leaving him. He wasn't happy about this decision, but Fiona stood her ground and bravely compromised to leave him but to remain living in his home village, Our Lady's Island, so he was close, to be able to stay in regular contact with his daughter. After the move, he moved back into his family home with his mother and Fiona rented a house with just herself and the baby. She worked on weekends in a local pub to support them, and whilst Fiona worked... Her ex's mother would look after her daughter. Finally, Fiona felt freedom. She began to see friends and family again and had some semblance of her old life. Her old personality began to shine through once more. Even though she was free of her ex, she felt as though he was still watching her. She would often see his car park nearby her house. In February 1998, Fiona was preparing for her daughter's first birthday. It was also nearing her sister Diane's birthday, so she was busy making plans to go shopping for presents for her sister's gift. She was 19 years old and living in a rented property with her 11-month-old daughter in Ballyhirt, County Wexford. Early February, Fiona had the weekend off of work, but her daughter's paternal grandmother was still going to be looking after her. So, child-free for a few days, Fiona organised an exciting and rare weekend full of plans with her friends. On Friday the 6th of February, 19-year-old Fiona and her friends went to a hotel in Rosslair. While they were laughing and having fun, Fiona noticed her ex-boyfriend enter the hotel and prop himself up at the bar. He didn't make any effort to talk to Fiona or her friends, but she was aware of his presence. Fiona befriended a Welsh lorry driver, and after a few drinks and some friendly chat, the pair decided to walk back to his truck because he had an early morning boat to catch from Rosslair to Fishguard. His truck was only 15 minutes away and once there the two sat in his cab chatting away when suddenly there was a bang on the passenger side window. It was Fiona's ex. She explained to the driver who he was and after some time he passed. Screaming had subsided and he gave up. The Welsh man didn't think it was safe for Fiona to walk home alone from there so drove her back to her home. 
Following the events of the previous night, Fiona likely didn't want to risk running into her ex again, so she didn't make contact with anyone, and she wasn't seen that day either. The following day, Sunday the 8th of February, Fiona had drinks planned with friends again. Three friends and Fiona were in a local pub, Butler's, a 40-minute walk from her house. They were having another chilled, friendly night together, when Fiona notably complained that her arm was hurting. We couldn't quite explain why, but she was clearly bothered by it. At 10pm, she used a payphone to call her family home. Her sister Diane answered, and Fiona could be heard begging for her brother Seamus to come to the pub to meet her. Diane noticed the urgency in Fiona's voice, but Seamus had to decline, as he was to be up early in the morning to go fishing. Diane questioned Fiona, but she assured her older sister that nothing was wrong, and they hung up. At 12.05am, Fiona approached the bar. She purchased two bags of peanuts to accompany her on the 40-minute walk home. At 12.10am, she left the bar, but not before barman Brian Breslin asked, Will I see you here next week for the disco? To which Fiona replied, Yeah, definitely. Brian recalls, Fiona was sober that night. She'd only had a couple of drinks, I'd say. Fiona left the bar that night and hasn't been seen since. Fiona's family had no idea she was missing until she missed their weekly meet-up at a Wexford cafe. They presumed she'd forgotten, but when she didn't contact them or show up the following week, Fiona's father Pat went to Kilmore Quay Garda Station and reported Fiona missing. Fiona's daughter should have been dropped back to her house on Monday morning, but she wasn't. Her ex's family didn't inform Fiona's family that they hadn't heard from her or seen her until they were asked ten days later. Upon investigation and questioning of Fiona's ex-boyfriend, he explained how, on Sunday, they left the pub together, they walked back to Fiona's house and he slept on the sofa. She had told him she was going to grab a lift the next morning to the doctor because of a pain in her arm. He had allegedly given her £3 for a taxi so she didn't need to thumb a lift. Once he had given her the money, his mother collected him at 9am on Monday morning. There was no answer as to why they hadn't dropped Fiona's daughter back to her that Monday morning as routine would deem normal. Technical examinations of Fiona's home found a number of personal items and belongings gone and the house was left spotlessly clean. This was something Fiona's family considered out of character for her. The discovery led the Gardaí to believe the house and circumstances had been orchestrated to make it look as though Fiona had run away, but her family insisted with everything that was planned and most importantly with who Fiona was as a person, she just would not have run away and she certainly wouldn't have left her child. Ten days after her family reported her missing, Fiona missed her sister's 21st birthday and the following day she wasn't present for her daughter's first birthday. It was at this stage that her family knew something was really wrong. Months passed, with no leads to suggest the whereabouts of Fiona. The missing persons case continued. The Gardaí arranged for Ladies Island Lake to be drained. It was a month-long search, with a 24 floodlit watch over it. But nothing was found or recovered. The family stood at the water's edge for weeks on end, just waiting and watching for something, anything, to point them in the direction of their youngest teenage daughter. Pat Sinnott would stand at the water's edge every day for weeks, waiting to see if the divers would recover his baby girl from the murky waters. It wasn't to be. Fiona wasn't there. The news took time to spread around the country. It finally reached a local farmer who recalled finding a number of black bags in the top corner of one of his fields. He opened the bags and found a number of personal documents containing Fiona's full legal name and also other items. The farmer had assumed it was just another case of illegal dumping and he disposed of the bags and their contents by burning them. As soon as he heard about Fiona being missing, he contacted the Gardaí to inform them of his findings. This only furthered the Gardaí's speculations that this was all a setup to look like a runaway. A local to Fiona's house also then recalled a line of black bin bags set outside her home around the time of her disappearance. A number of arrests were made, but no one has ever been charged in relation to Fiona's disappearance. In 2001, a man who was suspected to be involved in the disposal of Fiona's body was found dead in his car from a suspected overdose. On the 16th of September 2005, 
The Guardian announced the case would be escalated to a murder investigation from a missing person search. Later that day, five people were arrested. Fiona's ex-boyfriend was the assumed prime suspect, arrested under the Offences Against the State Act, along with him, his mother, his sister, his sister's boyfriend, his ex-girlfriend and a male friend were also arrested for allegedly withholding information about a crime. All were later released following questioning. In 2005, Fiona's case was upgraded from missing to murder. Five people were arrested. It was two women and three men. One woman was in her late 50s, but she would be in her 70s now. All were released without charge. I can't comment on the investigation really as it's an active case, but I would just like to say that the team we have behind us now at the moment are very proactive. Some further information also came to light that year, as a couple came forward and said they heard a young girl scream near Keisha Cross around 12.30am on the night Fiona left Butler's. The location was around a 20 minute walk from the pub and was on the way to Fiona's house, so completely fit with the timeline. The information had remained hidden for all those years because the couple were each married to other people and didn't want to expose their affair at the time. In 2008, a marble memorial plaque was due to be unveiled for Fiona in a local cemetery. However, the night before the unveiling, someone had vandalised and removed the plaque that was cemented into the wall. In 2015, a private message was sent to a Facebook page set up by Gina, Fiona's cousin. The author of the message explained how, at the time of Fiona's disappearance, Fiona's ex-boyfriend and his father were working on a house next to theirs implying that they had sufficient opportunity to hide a body, belongings or crucial evidence. They had reported it to the guards twice over the years, but ground had never been broken. The Sinnott family decided the best course of action would be to conduct a private dig, which spanned over two months. Unfortunately, they finished without finding Fiona. The family still live being unsatisfied by the private dig they did because, without professional help, they could never be content that they directed a thorough enough search. In 2015, we conducted a dig after information came through on Facebook and because of who the chief suspect was and that he had worked there at the time, we definitely felt that it was um, worth checking out. Uh, Nothing was found, but more tips came out on the back of the media coverage. um, So that was really positive. Our main focus was trying to find a septic tank and it took three days to find that. Um, and the, the only real reason why we found that was because we had the use of cadaver dogs from Trace. And um, once a dog actually located the septic tank, um, we had a local digger company come out and um, help us um, lift it. And I suppose the thing that I remember most about that is seeing my uncle being winched down into the septic tank itself and just goes to show how desperate you are um, and what you're what you're capable of doing just to to find her you know and bring her home and that's something that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life I think it was just so heartbreaking and everybody that was there felt the very same thing it's just it's unreal that you know these are the things that we have to go through to, to try find her and to bring her home you know Fiona's oldest sister Caroline sadly died very suddenly in 2017 after a short illness, at the tender age of 47. While working on a documentary called Missing, Fiona Sinnott, True Lives for Virgin Media in 2018, the Sinnott family obtained her medical records, which really shone a light on the severity of the situation in Fiona's home and personal life. The records showed she had been hospitalised as a result of physical abuse on a number of occasions. They detailed how she had been pushed down the stairs and fractured her foot at eight months pregnant. At least five separate admissions due to injuries of this nature, including bites to the leg and face. The admission count was so high the medical staff knew Fiona by name and pleaded with her to report her partner to the guards. Arguably the most striking detail that stuck out for Gina was a hospital visit the night before Gina's 18th, the party that Fiona failed to attend. Little did they know, Fiona was at home nursing her emotional and physical wounds at the time. Now, over 22 years later, the family have built up a large online following to help. Social media. 
We've almost 10,000 followers on Facebook and the support has been amazing. The majority of tips actually come from our Facebook page, which is uh, Fiona Sinnott Missing. And the family are grateful for all the support and well wishes and messages that they get from the general public because general consensus is that more or less everybody is behind the Sinnott family, especially after the documentary aired and saw um, the type of life she had leading up to her disappearance with the release of the information with the hospital records, um, you know, every, even people that didn't know the family or know Fiona personally, like they're actually heartbroken because it's still, it's 23 years later now and, you know, the family are still suffering. Like there's there's no resolution to this at all and everybody just hopes that um, someone will come forward soon just to push everyone's minds at rest and uh, we can start rebuilding our lives again, you know. The family believes she's close by. Fiona's older sister Diane told the media, I believe she's not far. She's closer than what we might think. You could be driving by her on the road all the time. Their father Pat sadly passed away in 2004 at just 59 years of age. On his deathbed he told his brothers, Don't stop searching for her. Find her. Which further solidifies Diane's words that the family never gave up hope. Pat died of a broken heart and died not knowing what happened to his little girl. The family fought for custody of Fiona's daughter after she went missing, but they lost to the young girl's father. They had visitation with her for a couple of years, but due to the long periods of time between visitation, the little girl ended up being more confused and upset being left with people she wasn't familiar with. The family made the heartbreaking decision not to put her through that anymore. Now that she is old enough, they want nothing more than to hear from her if she feels happy to do so, and they've made a public appeal for her to reach out. Conspiracies have filled the void left without evidence since the incident. Even now the case is periodically printed in Irish media. The most popular hypothesis is that of the vanishing triangle. This is a term used when referring to a group of young women who all disappeared in the mid to late 90s from a particular area in the eastern part of Ireland, in the vanishing triangle. It refers to six women, all young, aged from late teens to 40 years of age. They all disappeared suddenly without a trace and no clues found despite high-profile searches, five-figure monetary rewards in place for information and guardian investigations. A theory most pushed towards is that a serial killer was rife at the time. But Detective Alan Bailey has described this case as one of the most solvable cases in Ireland. Fiona's family have no closure. All they want is to know where Fiona is and to lay her to rest. You've denied a daughter to have her mother in her life. You've denied a father to pass away peacefully and even her sister passed away after all her relentless hard work and pursuit for answers. You've denied her siblings the right to a happy life. You've denied her friends the memories they couldn't make. You've denied my family resolution. For the love of God, please, we need to have her home. She's not yours to keep. And let me reassure you to whoever comes forward that there be no judgment from us because only God can judge. If you have any information relating to the disappearance of Fiona Sinnott, please contact the Guardi. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've liked what you heard, please leave us a review or some feedback. You can support us by listening to the show, leaving reviews or join us on Patreon. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks' time.